Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Development of Luminex Based Serological Test for COVID-19 Diagnosis and Monitoring. This webinar is part of an ongoing coronavirus virtual webinar series. I'm Susie Valdez of Labritz, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Luminex. For more information about Luminex, go to luminexcorp.com. So let's get started. I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive. To participate by submitting as many questions as you'd like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a box, ask a question box, and click send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, simply click on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. Without further ado, I now present today's speaker, Dr. Iman Tarhoni, a postdoctoral fellow at Rush University Medical Center at Chicago. For a complete biography of our speaker, please visit our biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Tahoni, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome, sir. Hello, Susie. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. I would like to thank you for this nice introduction, and uh, I would like also to thank uh, everyone that is attending the seminar today. Uh, today's presentation in today's presentation, I would like to talk about our uh, novel uh, COVID test, the uh, novel test for COVID-19 diagnosis and monitoring that we have been developing since the beginning of this uh, pandemic. Uh, before I begin, I would like to introduce my team. Uh, so beside me, Christina, Dr. Jeffrey Borgia, and David, uh, have been working tirelessly side by side to develop, optimize, and validate this test. And uh, just one thing to mention here, uh, because uh, the patent of this test is, is pending, I'm uh, a little bit limited uh, on the amount of data they can uh, share uh, in terms of uh, test specifics. But I would be happy to share uh, the validation results and the uh, clinical results. So the layout of this talk will be uh, started with, uh, will be, we'll begin with uh, uh, a brief focus introduction on the COVID-19. Then I will describe the current strategies and testing methods for, for the COVID-19, followed by uh, a description of the basics and the rationale for our tests, and then the validation results. Finally, I would be happy to take uh, uh, your uh, qu uh, questions and answer them after I uh, talk a little bit about the future directives. And uh, so uh, let's begin. Uh, so coronaviruses have been known historically for being responsible for a couple of major pandemics on the world, uh, including the SARS in 2002 and uh, uh, the MERS 2012. This one, is considered to be uh, a third head by this uh, fellow creature. Uh, in late uh, 2019, basically in December, coronavirus uh, uh, have been identified to be responsible uh, for uh, a cluster of deadly uh, respiratory distress syndromes in Wuhan, China. It rapidly spread, resulting, uh, on, uh, resulting in local epidemics and followed by global pandemics, which was announced by WHO in mid-March. In February 2020, WHO designated the COVID-19 for the disease, for the disease, and designated the, the term SARS-CoV-2 uh, for the virus. But for the convenience of this talk, I would be referring to a disease uh, uh, as, uh, uh, to the COVID-19, sorry, as a disease, and for the SARS-CoV-2 as virus. So let's take a closer look on the uh, coronavirus. Coronaviruses are called uh, coronaviruses. They are giving this name because of the shape of their, uh, of the, the shape that they take because of those uh, uh, spikes 
on their surface. These spikes that are color, colored red here, they are colored red for illustration, but they are formed of uh, form uh, of uh, glycoproteins that are that is responsible for binding to the angiotensin converting enzyme two receptor on the respiratory epithelial cells, and they facilitate the invasion of the uh, of the virus. When we look at the deeper structure of this uh, virus, uh, there beside the spike proteins, there are the envelope proteins which work with. Uh, with the membrane protein to give that spheroidal shape uh, of the virus and uh, uh, form the, the viral envelope. All that encloses the, the, <clears throat> the nucleocapsid protein, uh, which also interacts with the uh, uh, genetic, the, R, the genetic com component, the gene of the RNA, the gene of the virus, which is the RNA to form the nucleocapsid. I would come back to this structure because it's essential for the composition of our essay. So we'll go in detail, into, into details later. Uh, when we look at the pandemics figures, this slide, by the way, uh, was created uh, in June 13th. So, so far, the virus has infected more than 8 million globally. And it caused uh, it take uh, it took a life of uh, more than 444,000 uh, all over the world. Fortunately, half of this number uh, of this uh, half of these cases have already recovered. In the U.S. itself, there is a fourth of this number in terms of cases, and the fourth of this number in terms in terms of uh, deaths. The recovery is still low. Uh, which is about 25 percent. So when we look in the, on more details, the U.S. is still leading the, 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 the figures of the pandemics in terms of deaths and, uh, and uh, number of cases. So when you look at the death uh, and the case fatality ratio, U.S. is still on, on the forefront of this pandemic. Brazil is, is climbing up now. Um, in the U.S., we average the average number of cases detected daily is 22,000 per day. 66% uh, of them are among those age group between average between 18 to 64. Um, I would also come back to this uh, age group because it's it's essential for designing the the. the the, the, the mass screening strategy for the COVID-19. But the reason why these numbers are high uh, in the U.S. could be, according to CDC, could be due to the high testing capacity the United States is trying to implement. So, so far, the U in the U.S., we have been conducting, we, we have conducted uh, more than 23 million tests that can be averaged to f half a million tests per day since the beginning of March with the positive rates of uh, 11%. So when the, the interesting thing is that the, how the trend is different among different uh, uh, regions of the world, and even as well as uh, within the United States. So if you look at the graph on the left, the U.S. seems to be past the, the peak of this, hopefully past the peak of this pandemic. And uh, now it's still uh, showing a fluctuation of number of cases. Uh, when Brazil, like, it's just started to climb up the, the, the curve of the, of, the, of the cases. When you look at the right figure where we show different states, it is not the same for, for all the states here in the U.S. So as some areas are, prepared, are already recovered, like uh, New York or uh, uh, New Jersey. There are some other states which are climbing, just started to climb up, like Arizona and Arkansas and, uh, and Michigan as well. So we see like some regions are started to plan for reopening and ease the restrictions, and some reasons are, regions are, are just started to, 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 to to climb up the peak of the of the cases, that could be associated with uh, 
with the nature of the asymptomatic nature of the of some of these cases as we know that from 5% to 80% of the people tested positive of uh, of the virus uh, have been uh, they they showed no symptoms or like mild mild symptoms symptoms in the past therefore a large scale uh, large scale community level testing is critical to control the disease and reopen safely so far since the beginning of the pandemics nucleic acid uh, detection based on pcr has been the major laboratory test for diagnosis but uh, we have to mention that it's very specific but not uh, as good as uh, we expect for in terms of sensitivity it's very specific specific because it's uh, uh, it detects the viral gene sequence the rna sequence that is specifically unique to this virus but there are a lot of technical issues that i will describe in the next two slides regarding the the sensitivity of the that causes the low sensitivity of the of the test for that reason FDA announced the emergency uh, use or authorization uh, guide to, uh, in, in, in 2000, in, uh, sorry, in February 2002, describing the policy regarding the immediate use of tests developed by certain certified laboratories. Uh, the objective of this guide is to increase the testing capacity in the United States. So what are the current testing methods for the COVID-19? So beside the, 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 the PCR, the reverse transcription qualitative PCR, uh, which is depending on detection of a nucleic acid uh, uh, in the uh, swab from the nasopharyngeal uh, uh, or oropharyngeal swab, uh, we have other tests like uh, detecting the viral antigen uh, in the same sample. Uh, as far as I know, there is only one test that is uh, that is approved by FDA, and for which we don't know that much information in terms of validation. Uh, the current, currently, the very common test that used uh, in large scale is the serological immunoassays. Uh, these immunoassays um, uh, or serological tests are planned to detect the immunized uh, patients or patients who developed immunity to the disease, to, uh, to the virus. Uh, basically, they measure the immunoglobulin M and G. So they, nowadays, they are widely used in layer of the PCR. The rationale for that is that PCR has a couple of limitations. So PCR requires high-quality nasopharyngeal swab containing, it should contain a sufficient amount of viral RNA to do this, you, that, uh, you have to successfully co follow specific techniques that is, requires certain training by uh, operators and uh, requires successful transport of media and extraction steps. And uh, in addition to that, the amount of viral RNA may, be, may vary uh, from uh, within the same patient and uh, according to the different times when you take the test and uh, and also uh, th this procedure can be unpleased to the patient and sampling techniques can depending on the operator as I mentioned all these factors can lead eventually to insufficient um, amount of viral RNA that lead uh, to a false negative result in addition to that as I mentioned, the, the, this procedure requires high trained personnel to, uh, to uh, from the step of acquiring the sample to the step of producing the results. For that, uh, this can be done in, in lower scale, like in daily routines for, for hundreds of cases. But when we talk about large uh, groups in the pandemics, that means you're, you're trying to test thousands of cases per day it's going to be overwhelming to the uh, medical facilities and there will be a, a huge backlog of tests and uh, results. The, the turnaround will be uh, very high, I assume. So the rationale for using the, 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 the immune assay tests in layer of, uh, of uh, PCR in terms of screening is, is this is, can be described in this slide and this figure. So if we look at the 
at the beginning of this uh, uh, graph in day zero. That's, that's, that indicates the, the onset of symptoms. If, if you look at the evidence of the virus, you will see the virus on the, on the samples. So either the viral RNA or the antigen, they will be high in the, in the, in the by specimens, either uh, the, the nasopharyngeal swab or the urine or the blood, they will be high. Um, but that will go down by the time. And according to average of the time that was uh, reported, it goes down by the day six, and these numbers are just averages. In terms of immunity, uh, we see the immunoglobulin M, that's, uh, that's the red line, and the immunoglobulin G, they both go, start going up or responding in average of three to four days. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you test for the RNA, and the first three to four days of the onset of symptoms, you will you will see high sensitivity of the test, because you will you will detect the 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 RNA, assuming that you perform, as I mentioned, you perform an, an optimal procedure, and uh, and if you test uh, beyond the day uh, six or day five, you most likely to see a lot of uh, false negative if you run the PCR. Compared to the, to the immune, uh, when, when we look at the immune uh, detection uh, tests, it will be also highly, uh, it will yield high false negative at the beginning of the symptoms because there is no immunity, but it will be highly sensitive and highly, uh, uh, at high, high sensitivity in the, in the uh, like beyond the day six. So let's talk about, uh, so because of this, based on this criteria and the difference between the two tests, the performance of those two, those two tests, CDC announced uh, the surveillance of U.S. serology testing strategy. With this, uh, the, uh, the, the objectives of this strategy is to provide more complete estimate on how common the, vi uh, the virus uh, or the disease is and uh, to guide the measure, uh, uh, to the control measures such as uh, social distancing and reopening. The question CDC is trying to, to answer using this method or this strategy is that how much uh, of the US population have been infected without showing symptoms and how much of the US population have been infected generally. And uh, if, there, if these antibodies or this immu immunity can be associated with the protection and uh, uh, from future reinfection, and if they have any therapeutic implications. So let's describe the, the current methods of uh, serology testing. So uh, the majority of these tests are based on the lateral flow uh, assay uh, uh, techniques, which is uh, described in this uh, slide. So Basically, this is the card uh, that is uh, uh, simply you load the sample on this card and then the, uh, you load the buffer. The samples will flow laterally through, the, through different phases. The, the, the first phase is attached. It, it contains uh, gold COVID-19 antigen conjugates. And once these antigen conjugates encounter anti-COVID-19 antibody in the sample, it will show this light uh, uh, red uh, line on the, on the step five. And then you also have uh, uh, a control, which is a rabbit uh, gold conjugate, a control uh, indicator. So as the sample goes forward to the second line, which is C here, it should light up to show that the control is positive, so you know that the, the test is valid. So in, in step seven, you see that the positive test is, should contain the line for T, the test, and line for C, the control. And the negative test should contain only the line of C, that is the test is valid, but uh, no line for T. And if, the, if there's no C line, the control line, then the test is not valid anymore. So, 
Um, there are, so far, there are uh, like uh, tens of uh, approved uh, FDA uh, serology tests. I'm, I'm just showing a couple of them now. Um, they are different. Um, there are different uh, vendors, there are different manufacturers, uh, Abbott, Silex. Abbott and Silex are the most commonly used, but you see here they have different performance from sensitivity of 100% and uh, 93%, even though they are measuring the same target, the IgG for nucleic capsid or the IgG for spike. One thing here is that I, I didn't show, uh, show it here in this slide. Um, it, it, the majority of these tests have validated, validated this um, performance after day 12 of the onset of symptoms. And some of them uh, showed these uh, figures of sensitivity and specificity after day 14. Um, so now let's talk about the rational or the basics of our Luminex bead-based uh, tests. So our test is based on the platform uh, invented by Luminex XMAP bead-based technology. Basically, this, is, this technology is based on the reaction uh, or conducting the antigen or the target on the mic mag paramagnetic microsphere or beads. These beads are internally uh, dyed with two colors, the infrared and red fluorophores. These two colors would give the beads they, they are in different proportions. So they give those beads different uh, a color region or different ID that can be detected and can be distinguished from the other beads. So you can, uh, you have more than uh, 500 bead regions and you can, dis uh, you can uh, easily distinguish between those beads based on the color. So, uh, in order to develop this assay, basically, uh, you have the bead and, uh, and you, can, using the carbamide-based uh, uh, reaction, you conjugate the, the, the protein or the target or the capture molecule on the bead. And then you expose this, uh, sorry, you expose this uh, uh, bead to the, to the sample, serum, plasma, urine, or any kind of liquid biopsy sample. And then you add the secondary reporter that is conjugated with biotin. And then finally, you, you add the fluorophore. So there are different formats of this, uh, of this assay components or this uh, assay. Uh, this one specifically, um, and this one I'm describing what we, do, what we did for this test, this is called indirect assay for antibodies, as well when you conjugate the antigen on the bead in order to detect the antibody on the serum. The other formats are, are if you play with the arrangement of this assay, you actually conjugate, if, and if you, you actually conjugate the antibody on the beads, you can detect the cytokines or the protein that is soluble in the, in the biospecimen. With that, we, we, we call it a capture uh, assay for cytokines. It could be cytokines, hormones, soluble receptors, uh, ligands, any, any form of protein that is soluble. The third uh, form of this assay would be specifically for the for the nucleic, nucleic acid, is when you have a tag and anti-tag uh, react to each other and report it with the fluorophore. Finally, these beads uh, will be these beads will be uh, mixed to with with each other. I mean, imagine you you're performing a, a multiplexed assay where you take in uh, each of these bead regions uh, and conjugate it to a specific uh, uh, target. Let's say you have a bead one for IL-6 and bead two for TGF beta. Now, when you, when you mix them together and you can, as I said, you can mix up to 500 uh, beads and now even more according to the next generation uh, uh, instruments developed by Luminix. Now, if you 
in the in the luminex instrument you expose these beads into uh, two forms of uh, laser beams the green one is to detect the target the red one is to detect the bead region that's why the the multiplexing uh, capability of the instrument uh, so if you if the, 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 the beads the, the beads will flow by, uh, via a stream like in, in, in a streamline like the flow cytometry uh, technique and the both uh, lights will be able to detect the bead uh, number or the bead ID and the associated or the conjugated target the amount of target as uh, conjugated to these beads. Uh, one thing to mention that for illustrative purposes, I draw one molecule here, but you can imagine on the surface of these beads, you can conjugate as many as millions of, of, uh, of molecules. So you can detect millions of, uh, of, uh, of target molecules on the surface of these beads. That's why it's considered highly sensitive compared to conventional method methods like ELISA. Um, one thing also to mention, one of the uh, advantages of this is the is being uh, uh, immobilizing the immobilizing the target on those freely mobile beads. It allows more interaction with the sample, with the targets on the sample. That's why you see also high sensitivity of the results. So to, in order to design this essay, you have to go through different different phases. So first, you have to uh, you have to identify your targets, and this is usually based on different methods. So a, either you go based on the bioinformatics uh, analysis of current currently available data to identify your targets that you're going to be testing for. Second is, or the second option is to go based on the knowledge of the pathological pathways or the pathways responsible for the diseases and you select your uh, molecules of interest. A third way is to, uh, to uh, follow the analytical proteomics approach like mass spectrometry and uh, uh, basic uh, proteomics approach to identify your potential candidate target and then you de design this assay. Second, you, you purchase the reagents and uh, this is not easy process. Actually, you have to you have to figure out which the the best reagents that you can uh, up implement in this test, and you have to validate them to make sure that they work to add together. Uh, then the, you go. The third step is the coupling reaction to couple those uh, capture molecules on the microspheres, and then finally you optimize the assay in, to, in terms of. Uh, Say performance uh, specifics like the same linearity, the dynamic range, and the cross reactivity, and so on. So this is the the form of our uh, of our assay. In uh, so we have uh, four bead regions. We uh, co co conjugated uh, those four main components of the you know, uh, coronavirus on each bead. So. Uh, we designated one bead for the spike and nuclear capsid, and uh, for, for the other bead for the nuclear capsid, and uh, and so on. So we have four uh, uh, unique bead regions for uh, one for each uh, spike. For, sorry, one for each antigen, and we multiplex them together, and we optimize the assay according to the white box that you see on the left. So we optimized all these uh, specifics: the linearity detection limits. Uh, sensitivity, precision, cross reactivity, and, and so on. We then validated the test on the uh, two groups uh, the COVID uh, uh, positive group and the control group. And then we, we read them on the Luminex platform. And uh, I will report the results uh, later. Uh, so this is uh, just a description of the of the assay. These are indirect immune assays. Uh, it contains the spike, nucleic capsid matrix, and uh, and the envelope proteins or protein uh, uh, target. Sorry, to capture those antibodies specific for those. Uh, they have. Uh, we are looking for uh, uh, to forward to improve this performance, but we already tested the IgG, IgA, IgM, and also the total uh, IgM. 
So to start with, uh, as, as I mentioned before, I have some limitation to uh, or restriction to declare uh, much of data here. But here I am showing an example of the assay range and the linearity of the spike and the nuclear capsid, for example. We go into since we were able to get sensitivity as low as uh, decimals of picograms per ml. And uh, we, again, uh, one of the advantages that I didn't mention uh, is the, of this test is that we capture the four of them at once. So you, even if you miss the, even if the patient did not develop the, the antibody for spike, you're not going to miss it if he, if the patient developed antibodies for, for nuclear capsid, we still can test it positive based on the algorithm that we developed later. Um, so the first validation we did is to accommodate the, 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 the method of uh, specimen collection, which is based on the dry blood spot. Basically, this, these cards are available uh, uh, for low costs, and it can be uh, shipped at home, like shipped to, to the patient house, and we can uh, perform the finger prick test and just send it back by USPS. Uh, here we show in the, the difference. So let me talk about these figures. Uh, these are actually the first validation group is that it's the 10 positive cases and 10 control cases. And you can see the difference in the, in the level of the MFI. You can clearly distinguish the positive from negative by the difference in the, uh, at the level of the average MFI. Um, here in the in the light blue color or the turquoise color, it's the spike plasma concentration, uh, spike antibody, and uh, the light one was the one that it's uh, measured from the dry blood spot. So you see, it's it's it followed the same strange. That's why I'm showing this line graph, is to show that they follow the same uh, pattern. Uh, but with a little bit lower uh, intensity of the MFI. This can be optimized, but what we're trying to show here is that they, the, the feasibility or the applicability of dry blood spot uh, to collect sample for this test. The second, uh, the second uh, validation we try to test is the, is the accommodation of uh, the 38 uh, four-well plates uh, in layer of... Uh, uh, 90, 96 well plates. So 96 well plates. Uh, these are the. This is how we performed this test so far. Uh, uh, the, all this, the, all the st uh, steps that we performed were on 96 well plates. With 96 well plates, you can perform uh, 40 samples per plate. But with 384, you can uh, test for uh, 184 samples per plate. So that's with that we try to show that we can accommodate this platform or this uh, plat format or uh, in order to accommodate more testing uh, capacity for for this platform and here in the figure again you show you see the the turquoise color is the is based on the 96 well plates and uh, the 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 intensity of the mfi went a little bit down but uh, it still followed the same the same uh, uh, pattern when we tested the, the, the samples on the 384 uh, plates. So again, it's when you accommodate this test, you need to optimize it, but it's still uh, showing the same uh, results, the same sensitivity and uh, the specificity uh, performance. And uh, then we also validated the, the timing. So we consider that shorter time will be helpful to uh, to, uh, to 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 allow the, this test to be more uh, feasible in this uh, pandemic strategy. So the regular time for the test is uh, is eight hours total. But in order to to uh, scale it down to a couple of hours, we we showed that first we can we can optimize the secondary antibody. Uh, no, we, we showed how can we optimize the, the primary antibody incubation 
uh, from four hours to half, uh, to half an hour. You see here the white color is for four hours incubation and uh, the, the light blue color is for the, uh, 30 minutes incubation. Of course, there is a, de the, there is a decrease in the intensity of the MFI, but um, uh, it still shows the same pattern or the same uh, sensitivity to, to distinguish the COVID-19 positive from the control. And with that, we can, sh uh, we can uh, scale down uh, the performance time of this assay to the half, uh, that's four hours or three hours. We also did the same thing with the secondary. So we, we, we tested the one hour incubation versus 30 minutes incubation. And again, it showed not that much different of the, of the, uh, in terms of the MFI signal. So we still can accommodate this, uh, uh, this time too. Uh, so the total test will be around four hours or three hours. Uh, Finally, we did the uh, validation uh, with uh, with uh, clinical samples from uh, with, with the clinical samples from larger cohort. So we did we first selected the the control cohort uh, around uh, 262 cases from the uh, collected during the peak of flu season. Uh, the, sorry, the peak of flu season. Uh, that's collected from November to March uh, last year in our biorepository. Uh, with that, we, we aim to make sure that this does not, this test does not cross-react or give false positive uh, with other uh, flu-like viruses. Uh, about 75% uh, of those cases were COPD uh, that's chronic uh, uh, obstructive pulmonary diseases cases in this cohort. And they did not test positive uh, with, uh, with PCR for COVID-19. Uh, the positive cohort was 180 samples collected at Rush University Medical Center uh, from March 1st to uh, April 10th. And they all tested positive and they showed symptoms uh, of coronavirus of, of COVID-19. And uh, just one thing to mention about the, the, the drawback of this cohort is that it has been collected uh, regardless the time, the onset of symptoms. So we break down the, 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 those cases according to the time when, where, when their samples were collected. So 182, 180, 128 sorry, samples were collected in the first two days. And I put this figure again to remind you that during those first three days, you expect to, so, to, sh to, to see low sensitivity of the ser serum test, of the antibody test. So as we expected when we run the test for the both control and uh, positive group, we saw low sensitivity and uh, the, but I just have to mention here that we when we run the test, we developed uh, that classification algorithm on the uh, R part using R part package on our program to uh, come up with a classification algorithm to help using those four uh, targets to to classify the patients or to predict the, the diagnosis. So here's the performance, the sensitivity in overall results, regardless the time of uh, PCR tested uh, test, um, the sensitivity was 55%. The specificity was 98, and uh, accuracy was 80%. And uh, uh, and uh, the, the negative predictive value was 79, uh, 76%. Now we optimized this cohort uh, to include only people who were tested three days uh, and beyond, three days and beyond the onset of symptoms. So we, ap we applied the same algorithm, the same classification algorithm, and we, we uh, come up with better uh, or improvement of the performance of the sensitivity and specificity. So the sensitivity was 92%, specificity was 98%, and accuracy was 
then we went further to include only six days and beyond. And I want to remind you that the majority of the tests are under, according to the FDA, sorry, I didn't mention this, but according to the FDA recommendation is to test, uh, to validate these tests is to test beyond day 12 of the onset. And now we are trying the day six and beyond and implemented the same uh, uh, classification, classification algorithm that we developed. And we ended up with sensitivity of 100%, specificity of 98%, and the accuracy of 98%. Now, we went to the second phase of the validation when we increased the, the control uh, group to close to 1,000 patients. And uh, uh, with that, we aim to use uh, according to the recommendation from uh, from uh, FDA, is to use uh, as much large cohort as uh, possible for from the control to make sure that this test is applicable on the uh, as a screening test. And the control group uh, contains 44 patients collected to uh, in the 12 days. So with that, we we redesigned the the classification algorithm. Uh, using our program to uh, to show this uh, to end up with this uh, uh, classification uh, uh, system. So let me describe this classification uh, algorithm briefly. So you start when you have the sample. You you look the the algorithm will be automatically run to first look at the spike antibody. If it's more than forty uh, picograms per ml it will go automatically to look at the nucleocapsid antibody. If it is more than 24 picograms, then the patient is positive. If it's less than 24 picograms and also less than 40 picograms of, uh, of, uh, of spike, the, the blue color is, uh, uh, then you look at the membrane antibody. If it is negative, that is uh, less than one microgram per ml, then the patient is negative. If it is more than one microgram per, per ml, you look at the envelope uh, antibody. If the envelope antibody is uh, more than 28 pic uh, micrograms, it, the case is positive. And uh, if it's less than that, the case is negative. So in this, just one thing to mention that this is all its uh, bioinformatics system. So you just, you basically run the raw data on the bioinformatics program and it will come up with this decision either positive or negative. So when we did this test on the 100, uh, 1,178 patients, we came up with, uh, with sensitivity of 100%, specificity of 99.6%, uh, and accuracy of 99.6%. That is, that is, uh, uh, as, uh, is outstanding performance comparing to other tests. And also, we are uh, pro we are uh, presenting uh, uh, a method, a multiplexed method to test four uh, targets at once, or four antibodies at once. So we make sure you do not miss this case, even if the patient did not develop uh, antibody for one of them. Uh, so again, these are the the performance of the other. Uh, uh, of the current tests, which is uh, comparable to others. Uh, now, when we talk about the, how can we implement this test, generally, if you wanna uh, incorporate it with uh, PCR testing in, in order to diagnose or plan the, uh, for, uh, for back to, to work or reopening. So simply, if you have, if you conduct, uh, if you have negative PCR test that there's, that means there's no indication of the virus uh, in the body. And if you have also uh, a negative antibody test, that means you, are, you, have, you haven't encountered this virus before and you are susceptible. So you, the decision that can be taken based on that is to maintain social distancing and stay home. If the PCR was, was positive and the antibody was negative, that means you are infected but you don't have immunity yet you're supposed to go into quarantine. You are infectious, simply. If the both tests were positive, you are also 
uh, in infectious phase, uh, uh, and you have the, uh, and you 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 are you are in, you you have the virus and you have the immunity, so you are still in. You need you need to be in quarantine because you're still uh, in infectious phase. However, when when the immune when the immune test uh, is positive and the PCR is negative. That means you, the patient has encountered the, the, the virus at some point in the past, and then he developed the immunity. This will make him or make the, the person categorized, or that we can categorize this person as a safe person, and he can go back to work, go back to school, and uh, without being uh, concerned to infect or spread infection to other people. So. The immediate application of this test is to provide a convenient and cost-effective uh, means to test non-vulnerable populations or non-symptomatic populations, uh, um, mainly those uh, groups that I mentioned before, the 66 percent uh, young and middle-aged groups, who are, we expect that those are dynamic uh, portion of the population. They go to schools, they go to work, they hang out all the time. You can you can uh, you can pro pro you can uh, screen those people on large scale and uh, decide and help to plan to uh, return uh, to work or stay home decisions. Uh, we with this test we envision that we provide means to uh, evaluate plasma in the blood banks for therapeutic uh, conventional therapeutic plasma. Uh, to use based on the strength of immune receptor of immune response, sorry, um, uh, to the COVID nineteen uh, COVID nineteen virus, and we also can use this test as a companion diagnostics method for uh, uh, to monitor the vaccine efficacy and duration of uh, antibody titers. It can be also be convenient to epidemiological monitoring of infection rates worldwide, and as I mentioned before, the, according to uh, across the regions of the countries or the states. Uh, it also will relieve the burden of the clinical laboratory struggling to keep up with the PCR-based tests uh, of active cases, the, the backlog of, uh, of these tests. Now, usually they run them in the three days or uh, two days. Um, the future directives is uh, regarding this test is that we're going to uh, refine the assay and uh, transform it to automate, uh, automated workflow. And uh, again, we're going to accommodate 384 well plates and uh, optimize it further for uh, dry blood spot uh, method. And uh, we also, we are uh, collecting, we are actively collecting more samples uh, uh, from uh, Rush University Medical Center to uh, prepare for FDA uh, validation in the next two weeks uh, uh, using the, the, the emergency use authorization. Uh, we have multiple federal funding mechanisms uh, being pursued uh, for uh, Chicago-based research networking, and we are open for uh, uh, collaborate, collaborators. Uh, this is, like I mentioned, uh, we currently, we, the Rush is ongoing, uh, is, is doing an ongoing collection of samples and uh, uh, admitting patients uh, and testing, screening patients in the community uh, in Chicago. So we are uh, also collecting samples uh, uh, in our biopository to uh, to further validate this test. To conclude the slides, I wish every everyone uh, to stay home and practice social distancing. And uh, hope if you have any question, uh, please ask me now uh, in the QA session, or you can uh, you can contact Dr. Jeffrey Borgia on his email shown on the slide. If you have any additional question or interest to uh, uh, collaborate and research or uh, license agreement. Uh, thank you so much, Susie. And thank you, Dr. Tarhone, for your informative presentation. And we will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. 
So Dr. Chahoni, we already have several questions coming in from our audience members. <clears throat> and thank okay. you all for joining us today. Mm -hmm. What's the plasma sample dilution in the slide shown? So we did uh, one to 500 dilutions. We, we tested multiple dilutions, but currently we, uh, we identified one to 500 as the best. Thank you for that. And the sensitivity mm -hmm. is low, 55%, when samples within the first three days on symptom mm -hmm. onset and much better starting from six days. How early can we consider this test with acceptable accuracy? So like I showed, um, uh, we can, uh, we expect accuracy uh, comparable to current tests at day six. So, uh, which is uh, still an outstanding performance because a lot of these figures that we saw from other tests are tested at day 12 and beyond. And we were able to show the same figure at day six. Thank you. And are there any other serological tests which only detect one target but have the same, the clinical validation performance as yours? And if there were, why could they achieve it without using your multi-testing strategy? Um, can, can you say that the question again? Sorry. Sure, of course. Sure are there... It. Are there any other serological tests which could only detect one target but have the same um, clinical validation performance as yours? Uh, there are actually what I showed the, the current tests available. They all have the same. Uh, the, the majority of them have the same characteristics, but this is according to their validation studies. And uh, what I'm trying to mention here is I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like criticizing anybody, but a lot of these tests when, we, when they were tested and from other institutions, they, they show different, uh, different characteristics, different performance. And sure. um, yeah, so there is a lot of debates. There are a lot of debates uh, on the, the, the actual performance of these tests, uh, but they are still like, uh, uh, outperforming tests. That's that's how can I say. Thank you for that. Yeah. We have time for a few more questions. Can you collect plasma from a patient who still has positive results for the virus? Yes, of course. Uh, is that the plasma for diagnostic purposes or for the therapeutic purposes? Uh, Are we uh, talking about perhaps they can rewrite they'll have to rewrite there in the question and, and we can answer that um in a yeah. in maybe written and why do you choose a cohort of age median of over 60 for your clinical validation so those are so first those this is the cohort in our biobasically uh, second these are the most vulnerable group uh, for the COVID-19 tests and I mean, as I mentioned, uh, majority of these tests are majority of these tests at Rush University were conducted on the um, th those patients were admitted at Rush University Medical Center. So these have uh, 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 you know uh, those are the the majority of them are in this age group. Speaking of the the control group, these are the the patients that we screened for lung cancer uh, previously, and they have this average of uh, the, this age of average of age. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and what okay. is the dilution with dried blood spot? Um, uh, so I, I, I'm okay. Uh, the dilution we're still optimizing it, but the, that dilution that we did. Um, at that time was uh, one to one, uh, one to 500 as well. We're testing different dilutions as of today, we're testing another dilutions for, uh, for a dry blood spot. Thank you, and again, audience members, yeah. great questions coming in. Any questions we can't answer today will be answered via email. <clears throat> Dr. Sure. Tony, is your test qualitative or quantitative? It can be both, it's uh, what we run now is uh, quantitative test with a standard curve and uh, we can perform it on a qualitative basis as a positive negative. Thank you and our final question 
How did you validate the quantitative part of your algorithm? Do you have controls for this? And if so, what are they? Yeah, that's why this is the, the initial quantitative uh, uh, test was based on the uh, two things. So first was the, the recombinant proteins and the antibodies from other species. We also used the standard curve from serial diluted samples uh, now and for being positive. But of course, we're now developing, uh, we're now pursuing uh, actual purification of the human antibodies to run the quantitative, quantitative uh, standard curve. We're looking for these. Uh, yeah. Dr. Tahoni, thank you for your presentation today. Do you have any final closing remarks that you'd like to say to the audience before we close today? Um, no, actually, just uh, I want to stress on the advantage of multiplexing uh, strategy when you develop tests versus using, uh, versus using uh, uniplex or one target. Uh, we've been known for, uh, as a group, to develop the multiplexing uh, tests for screening of lung cancer and uh, uh, prognost uh, developing prognostic tests for lung cancer. And we encountered that we, we, we experienced the difference between looking at one target at time versus looking at different uh, biomarkers at, at once. It's, it's more informative, more accurate, more sensitive, and more uh, it's uh, outperforms other platforms. Dr. Tony, thank you for your presentation and for your time today and your important research. And before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Luminex, for the sponsoring today's webinar. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand through the end of 2020. Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, stay safe, take care, and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan.